Super, we are now live. Thank you to all the participants here that have joined us to this debate and of course to our wonderful panel. I hope that all of you are safe and healthy as well as your families. This is a wonderful session that awaits us today. BioResponse, powered by Wikifactory, was developed because we wanted to bring communities together in response to COVID-19 and to help create a more resilient world beyond. These regular roundtables is our chance to bring these communities together virtually and directly to share insights and learnings from diverse perspectives. This is now session three. It all kickstarted at the end, at the start of this month, where we brought a community of projects developing PPE, ventilators, built environment solutions, and, and a panel of experts to review their products. Last week, we had the opportunity to explore the possible funding opportunities, the business models that are available for COVID projects to become viable. And this week, it's a particularly important question to me and to Wikifactory because community is at our core. We would like, in, like to deepen the question to how can we build open hardware communities in response to COVID-19? I couldn't be better surrounded today with, in this virtual round table with these experts. I'm delighted to be sitting here with uh, Rogine Lyons from Team OSBX, Barbara Kislinger from Carables, Barry Watkins from Helpful Engineering, Nathan Parker from Emergency Maker Network, Oscar Velazquez from Impact MX, and of course, from the Wikifactory team, our co-founder and CEO, Tom Salfield. Each of these panelists will be given a five to seven minute slot to share their perspective to the topic. And we'll be following the presentations with a live Q&A where we will open up to debate. We hope to keep this interactive. Please send your questions through the Q&A button below. And we'll also be in the spirit of interactivity sharing a couple of polls and we will make sure that those polls and the insights gathered in these sessions will be shared to all of you participants after the event. Should I forget anything, we will be uh, covering all of, uh, of today's event through Twitter and through Facebook. It is broadcasted live through uh, Facebook for those who are viewing us or would like to view the session afterwards. And so please do follow us on Facebook and on Twitter through our handle at Wikifactory and with the hashtag viral response. And we'll be sure to gather the info and respond to you through there as well. So let's start. I would like to uh, first open up the floor to Rojan Lyons. She's assistant professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at Dublin U City University. And now during this time, she is now co-founded team OSB Extended an open innovation community focused on COVID-19 solutions and outreach. Over to you, Rajan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a million for having me. I uh, just want to share a couple of slides so that I am not forgetting anybody when I uh, tell you our story. So um, I hope you can see that now. So um, the background to me is I am a lecturer and a researcher in entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, I work in a college in Dublin and I have studied innovation my whole life and I suppose in the last three months have really got to see it in motion in, in a really real sense. Uh, it all started when a couple of my friends put out a tweet asking for people to help with some open source solutions for the coronavirus. This was about three weeks before lockdown in Ireland. They were uh, Unindated with responses, um, it you know thousands and thousands of doctors, engineers, frontline staff, all jumped onto a an online community, a Slack community, to try and solve some of the problems that were pressing in Ireland and internationally. Uh, and it grew and it grew, and uh, it became a a two pronged approach. One Slack channel devoted to the, the hardware ventilator solution of which multiple iterations happened and they 
the group gained huge success in a number of different channels. You can see in that slide there just how many versions of the ventilator were created by groups all over the world. Interestingly, uh, once lockdown happened across the globe, these open source designs were taken by different groups who were trying to work in private labs, work in their own resource centers to try and test that around. And so as that was growing, we were realizing that there was even more people joining our community that weren't necessarily specifically engineers or hardware experts, just people trying to do something. And we recognized that there was plenty other problems that needed solving. So rather than confuse the one Slack community, we started a second and we called it OSVX. And this was for non-ventilator uh, aspects. So it related to software problems, you know, service issues, even outreach and volunteering campaigns. Anyone that felt like they needed to do something and found their way to us, we tried to find them a home. And you know, doing a poll of some of the 1,500 members that we have in this community now, it's incredible to see the range of people that we have in that community. Um, interestingly, uh, three axe throwers uh, among that group, one with a Guinness World Record. Uh, we have bikers, web designers, students, uh, really, you know, word of mouth traveled in this community. The types of projects we work on uh, are proposed by frontline staff and uh, Jill Barry, one of our other founders who is frontline clinical expert, she helps to create good project proposals around these. So we've worked on some really interesting projects, the face shields and face masks and PPE resourcing that a, a number of our speakers today will be talking about, but also, um, you know, more interestingly, things about biohazard stuff, uh, decontaminating floor trays so that wheel rotations don't contaminate trays and as trolleys are moving around corridors. Lots and lots of very interesting uh, aspects. And now we're starting to move into the more service-based approaches like what schools need to do uh, and how the, this crisis is evolving, the new problems and the new aspects that are coming up uh, that frontline soft workers and other general people are finding are knock-on effects of this crisis. So with this community and, and definitely my perspective as being the kind of community manager and one of the founders of this channel, it was very tricky in the sense that we had um, a huge range of people, many of whom had never used Slack before, or a community like this, many of them had never done open source collaboration before. We had a range of projects moving from hardware to software and to outreach. And so even just organizing and documenting and trying to move people in the right channels was a real um, challenge. Uh, particularly because none of the founding team or the organizing team had ever used Slack before either. So we were all new to, to the initiative and we had to really think on our feet. Um, at the same time, restrictions were getting stronger and, and real need was starting to be felt right across the world, but particularly and acutely in Ireland, um, where a number of our members were, were from. So just to show you, and, and, and I am sticking to the five slides, don't worry, Christina, um, just to show you a bit of the range that we had, just to give you that perspective, we had a group of designer and artists working on, um, on guidance posters that were not as scary for maybe our retirement centers. They were translating those into multiple languages so they could be used right across the world. A designers, artists, loads of people in that, in that channel. Added to that, some translators joined that group and started to translate them out. So there was kind of multiple groups working there. Um, Abby in Calcutta started Paper Shield, a group that was looking at how to replicate some of the frontline equipment in paper form so that it was cheaper and it was uh, less risk to recycle or to dispose of. So there was a group working on just paper-based um, you know, solutions for what's currently out there. Uh, on another channel, we had our bikers. So uh, seeing the need for PPE distribution, um, looking for a solution that was out there, one of our group was involved in a biker gang and he got all of those involved. 
And currently we have a dispatch and delivery network of one, over 1,100 bikers uh, who go around Ireland delivering PPE from companies uh, or manufacturers that need them. So that's been for Ireland, that's a huge in, in terms of our size, that's a really large national network. And these are voluntary, every single person on our Slack community, including the committee, uh, are voluntary, no one has fundraised for our initiative uh, at all in the in the couple of months that we are, are active. So that's to give you a span of what has been going on. But the question that we were talking about uh, was how do we manage it? So very early on, what we did was we divided up and gave every project to project managers. Uh, safety in numbers, we don't devote any role to one person. Every role has two people. Uh, we divide, developed a project development pathway running through what we would feel would be the best way of using our project and helping to support it. This was handy for our project managers so that they could really see what their vision was supposed to be and what their aim was. As an open source community, we considered that the phase one output or one of our main aims would be to present a really good, insightful piece of information about a problem, you know, one possible solution and how that would frame out. And if we could publish that as a, you know, an insightful piece of information, that would be great. Someone might take that in another country and roll with it, ideal. Um, but if, you know, it's the information that we were trying to, to get out there. Phase two was if the product or the solution was needed, a group might spin off and focus on manufacturing and getting that out there. And we have had a number of successes in terms of um, goggles, face shields, and so on in that space too. We had quality management, we had discussions, we have weekly project manager meetings, and we have connected with as many open source communities as we have, have tried. And that's why most of the people watching this today um, and the speakers will know me from like DMing them on their Slack channel saying, can we join in? Can we work together? Um, I think openness and collaboration is key for all of this. And then I am a researcher. So when I don't know the answer to a question, I look at research and there is a growing level of research on how to manage open source communities and, you know, how to be realistic about them. And, you know, many of the COVID-19 communities are now, you know, experiencing uh, kind of that, re, you know, that, that um, I would say limiting of engagement because they've had to move back to their own jobs. There's kind of a cyclical process of engagement with voluntary members and they have to be always brought back into the circle with a new challenge or a new wave of energy. And so it's interesting to see how our community has moved through that and we are experiencing challenges about momentum at times or if a project has hit a wall in terms of not getting the information from health service, et cetera. Uh, it, it can be a challenge to keep that momentum going. So there was a couple of, of different bits that we tried to enact based on what we had learned from research. Um, you know, and some of it's very kind of obvious about trying to hold local webinars or give people that personal touch or that voice. Um, but I think it's it's, it's great to be able to follow this. And part of my next six months is actually I uh, received funding to do some research on the open source community in times of crisis and whether or not this whole COVID-19 crisis has affected our trajectory as an open source community or, you know, has it affected momentum? And I think that, you know, we have had a lot of challenges, but we've had so many successes. And I think the real learning for us has been you know, how we have pulled together, how people are so committed and loyal to the channel is, you know, insane. The people that we have been in contact with, it seems like it's been years when it's only been a couple of months and none of us have ever met face to face. So I think we, need, we do need to learn from that and, you know, make sure that we can foster that again and we wouldn't need such an external trigger like a, a pandemic for that. We need to to figure out the secret. So that's me. I'm delighted to hear all of the rest that's going on. And thanks again for, for inviting me onto the panel. Fantastic contributions. Rajan, that was awesome. I would love to share that presentation 
following this uh, session. Um, great research. I like how you have designed your communications and collaboration systems and how you've brought about this collaborative culture in Team OSB Extended. Um, perfect uh, bridge to now invite in Barbara Kislinger. Um, interestingly enough, we have had conversations uh, with members of her community called carables.org, specifically about how to bring different type of stakeholders into uh, a collaboration context, into open innovation. Because Carables is an EC funded project on open healthcare, which facilitates co-design, making and sharing of open personalized healthcare for everyone. They have a great portfolio of dozens and dozens of projects that they've co-created with medical experts. It's a fantastic website. I'm very happy to have you here, Barbara. Over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. Thanks everyone for the invitation. I will also share my screen now. So I hope that you can, can you see it now? And I will go to, oops, doesn't work so good for me. Let me see. Um, yeah, share, oh, I can share. I hope you, you can see it now, right? Can you just say? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, perfect. So yes, thanks again for the invitation. I'm speaking here in the name of Carables, but Carables, actually there are people who would be much more um, you know, um, into speaking here uh, than me because I am coordinating, so to say, from a European project perspective, the whole group, but it's so much more you know, we started as a European funded project uh, over two years ago. And so we had the opportunity for two years to prepare for this, let's say, because we committed from the beginning to co-design and making of open personalized healthcare. So um, DIY healthcare was just starting and, you know, people were taking initiatives and we wanted to give that more of a, of a forum and, and a platform for sharing and activities around it. So this is how we all started. And we are now, we are still a project, but we are much more. So we understand ourselves now as a, as a community that has grown since then. And we have grown globally actually. And I can you know, talk about more examples then, but especially with our partner, the GEEK, uh, the Global Innovation Gathering, who is actually a network of uh, maker spaces, especially in the global South or also individuals. Um, they have been super active in contributing and taking on the Carables idea and sharing their designs uh, also before. So as I said, we were doing this um, personalized, uh, making personalized open health care um, and it had already, uh, the platform had already over 100 designs on it when COVID came along. And so we said for COVID, of course, uh, this is also the time where we have to provide the community uh, with our support. And so what we did is on the one hand, uh, we shared stories um, from people who were active in our community, like our Brazilian partners in Olinda, they uh, have uh, been, they've been working with healthcare providers also before. So they already had connections. They were taking up designs from people who shared designs on our platform, for example, from Berlin, like the face shield. Uh, and then they took it up and they modified it and they shared their experience again on our platform. And this is just one example. There were so many others as well. Um, so we also shared their personal stories on our platform. We shared resources. Resources was very important for us also because we felt that what is important uh, is uh, a kind of a trusted space. So people who take on designs from others where they know that this is already a, a trusted peer, a safe space. So I can try something out and I can also say if it fails. So also admitting in during the making or so what works and what doesn't work was, was for our community very important and feeling that they already are in contact with people where, they, where it's okay you know, to say what works and what doesn't work. And from that also somehow some of the handbooks came out or we have, for example, um, a legal department involved from the big very beginning 
in our project and they were very helpful in providing specific legal advice also what changes now you know how far can open health care be made now uh, in these maker spaces and what are uh, what are legal implications for example that varies of course across countries a lot but still they were able to give some basic advice and actually they are being asked now quite a lot so they're also very busy at the moment with giving uh, the legal advice on that and then of course one of our core um, of our core tools in Carables is our Wellnera platform where we are collecting uh, projects where uh, people can document what they're doing and we try to support people also in the documentation uh, if they need any support there. Uh, at the moment, we, as I said, we have generally lots of projects out there related to open health and care, but we have also specifically 45 projects now on uh, labeled with the COVID-19 tag. So where people provide solutions specifically for um, fighting COVID-19. And just a little bit also sharing our other activities that's contributed to community building is of course the Carables uh, global Slack channel and the Carables, um, the Geek Carables channel on WhatsApp. There has been so much going on in countries in the global south and they're you know continuously exchanging their experiences um, same for our um, activities in terms of capacity building we are taking up the topic of covid there now and actually i should say that you know unfortunately enrico bassi from open dot cannot be, be here because he's speaking at the same time at a similar event, <laughs> the similar webinar. But for example, they have been uh, together with the project, the DVMD project, coordinating summer schools where they teach uh, co-design, design thinking and digital fabrication. And in our case, always with the focus on, on health issues, health and care issues. Or the Academy, our team in Berlin, they work a lot with another organization, Match My Maker. So what we, what I want to say here for community building, for us, it's very important that we have these established networks, that we work with other projects, with other initiatives. And another final example in terms of partnerships is in, in Italy, again, where since Enrico has been and he's told his team, they have been working for many years now, also with healthcare professionals, healthcare providers. So there was already an established trusted uh, relationship. And so they, we are also now as Carables working with the two platforms in Italy that provide COVID-19 support. So the Tech for Care and the Make in Italy, they're both platforms that are now connected to our app as well, uh, to our platform as well, and exchange uh, the designs. And, and again, just to stress here, that for us, for our team, maybe I should also mention quickly the VAC team, they have been working a lot in the Netherlands, again, with, uh, with uh, care homes or with hospitals. So they've also had um, already the contact with the target group. And, and again, this, these established networks, trusted networks uh, was very important for us to, um, yeah, in these activities. So thanks a lot and I'm happy to then talk more about it, but I tried to make it really short. Thanks, Barbara. Well, I'm glad you were able to join. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a holiday here, but I'm fine. <laughs> it would have been great to have Enrico here as well, but I understand mm -hmm. it would be a great session. Coincidentally, we did have Kate from DDMP last, here last week to discuss business models and okay. opportunities, which is super. Um, over to the next panelist. I'm delighted to be welcoming Barry Watkins. He brings a wealth of experience in a unique blend of product marketing management skills with a creative background that he's now put into practice in healthful engineering. It's a 3,000, over 3,500 strong volunteer organization of engineers, scientists, and doctors around the world that's dedicated to helping the world address the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Barry, for joining us today. I look forward to your contributions. Over to you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and thank you to everybody else on the panel. Uh, I mean, it's a, I'm surrounded by a great group of people here today and uh, learning a lot so far, and I expect to learn more. 
uh, talk a little about uh, helpful engineering here. I assume you can see my screen. Um, I'm Barry Watkins. I'm uh, operations co-lead and QARA lead for helpful engineering. Uh, we started back in uh, early March, and uh, when they launched this uh, with a, on a Wednesday with about 35 people, put some information out with uh, a number of, uh, you know, through Reddit and a number of other different sources, other sources. And by the end of the weekend, we'd gotten over uh, 2,000 people who had joined. Uh, and uh, I kind of joined on between those and kind of hopped in early and uh, was uh, uh, quite shocked by the explosive growth of it all. I mean, I knew there was a lot of us out there that were looking to try to solve the problem uh, with uh, what was going on with uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, and uh, there were a, a number of people that joined. We managed to get up to over 6,000 volunteers uh, at its peak, and we're kind of back down to about 3,500. Uh, we've got about 16,000 people following our Slack channel, and uh, so it's a, a pretty large organization that, as we've talked with uh, some of the others that have spoken about already, we've seen a definite peak, and now we're kind of dropping back off on the interest level as uh, as uh, people have to go back to their real jobs, and as uh, you know, things start slowly opening up, and the world uh, kind of uh, is is available to people again. Uh, some of our volunteers have started to move back out and and, and do their real real jobs again. But uh, as an organization, what we've uh, what we're trying to do moving forward forward is uh, support a large number of projects and continue to support them as we go forward uh, in a number of different levels. So um, uh, one second here, I want to get to our uh, mission statement is, uh, you know, that we're an international open source community incubator focused on mobilizing people to help solve COVID-19 pandemic and other critical issues with thousands of volunteers worldwide. And we're supporting projects through innovations in engineering, community resources, software, and manufacturing. So uh, one of the first things that we managed to put out was the origami face shield mask, uh, face shield. And uh, this is a uh, product that is able to be, uh, anybody who can work with PET plastics uh, can uh, work with this. this. These unit went out for about a buck a piece uh, in face shields and were able to be flat packed at 100, 100 a piece uh, within uh, packs and was a very quick and easy, effective way to, uh, uh, to provide uh, kind of disposable PPE in a, uh, you know, in a format that can be used by not just hospitals, but a lot of other nursing homes and other things that weren't ready to spend the big money on expensive face masks. Um, the next thing that we ended up uh, working on is uh, the mask project. And uh, this is a respirator that uses a uh, reusable filter disc. Um, these are going to come out at approximately somewhere between a uh, cost of around $15 uh, with, uh, with uh, replaceable discs that would come out at a cost of about uh, a buck a piece. Uh, these are both uh, all of our projects that we're putting out uh, um, uh, with the various groups that we're working with are open source. Um, this project has now moved into uh, working with another group as well uh, to put this forward as an open source uh, as an open source project that any manufacturer can go ahead and uh, grab the plans for and and build. Um, you know, we've got uh, started with a number of guiding principles that we were working with uh, that was mainly to keep an open community where uh, other groups can join us or leave us as they wish and get a, a number of services that we help provide uh, for different groups. And so the way we managed this was through kind of an incubation model. So we have the idea of a swarm, which is a number of projects that can come in there and uh, work with us. And uh, we provide a certain level of pro uh, project support to swarms, mainly kind of off the shelf QA and RA information, uh, the ability to get uh, to look at our uh, group of volunteers and potentially go into our help wanted and a few other channels and grab uh, volunteers that, you, that you're looking for to help your project. Um, uh, then we've also set up, uh, like I said, a tiered view where those swarm projects can apply to be uh, brought into our incubation model. So uh, what we do is we build a project, we have a project registry, a project selection process, and a moderation process that allows us to pick from the large group and uh, uh, grab a number of groups that can get additional help from us. And that additional help can be communication support, um, marketing support, uh, QARA, uh, the help of actual people who will come in and help you work and do QARA, uh, some legal help, uh, help with recruiting, 
uh, you know, uh, DevOps and software engineering help, uh, help with fundraising, finance, international relationships with our teams, and strategy and leadership help. Uh, we also have a medical team, a software support team, and a hardware support team that become available to those that uh, get through that next set, uh, get through that first gate of uh, products that uh, decide to come on board. And those people that join us have to agree to a set of cert certain set of standards. I won't go into here, but it's kind of a higher level of QA and RA, uh, you know, regulatory uh, support for your product. And so uh, if, you're, if you agree to accept this level of help from us, then uh, we are happy to, uh, to work with you. So the selection, selection process is we go through and do a uh, you know, call for proposals about bi-weekly. Uh, then those people get, uh, those projects get uh, rated uh, yeah, on a scale uh, with a number of different, uh, number of different metrics. And then they get the, those projects get championed by the larger group. So, you know, those, some of the criteria is potential impact on society, how likely you are to be addressed within the industry, what your scalability is, the strength of your team, those kinds of things all come together to, uh, uh, to help out, uh, you know, to help us select uh, which projects will go forward. So far, we've done ventilators, respirators, face shields, oxygen concentrators, swabs, all of this, by the way, you can go look at the projects on helpfulengineering.org. And uh, so we just have a number of different things that uh, we've uh, really been able to help projects with. And with that, I will keep this uh, brief and uh, allow this to go back to the others so that uh, they can go ahead and continue forward um, with, uh, with what uh, they have to say. Thanks. Thanks a ton, Barry. I was absolutely fascinated to hear you mention the word swarm. Uh, because when this all started, exactly, the book Swarm Wise by Rick Finch, which I believe is the one that you're mentioning in yeah. terms of the learning resource, also came to mind. Um, clearly, all of these um, uh, models, uh, different, you know, research here in terms of different open source methodologies that can serve us in building communities is super useful. And I was super impressed when this all kick started to see the resources developed by Helpful Engineering. Uh, some of the Google Docs that I found when I was taking a look at what the community was doing. And the same goes with what Nathan Parker, our next panelist, has been developing uh, with Emergency Maker Network. Nathan is also a Renaissance man. He has done what has he not done? Uh, he has been a software provider, software and hardware product manager managed events, done large-scale interactive art installations, and also startup founder. Now with Emergency Makers Network, he's on a mission to enable medical professionals anywhere in the world to place requests for critical supplies made from medically reviewed open source designs that can get automatically matched with a fabricator in, our dis in their distributed network. Nathan, it's a pleasure to have you here. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so good to see so many familiar faces. Barbara, Tom, uh, Barry, I don't think we've actually met, but I've been in the helpful engineering Slack since day one or two and, and had a number of conversations with your people. Um, everyone else I haven't met yet, but it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for having me here. So let's see. I, I do not want to be the, the wet blanket here, uh, but I feel like that's important in all these conversations to talk about, in addition to what has worked, we also need to talk about what hasn't because the situation that we're in doesn't get easier from here. You know, this is, this is we'll start with some, some depressing real talk and then we'll move into why it's hopeful later. Uh, so the last, you know, the last five years or so I've been along with some folks like Christina at this very niche intersection of open source hardware, uh, distributed manufacturing, disaster resilience, and the maker movement. There's, you know, the, the tiny Venn diagram, there's like 12 of us. Um, and so when all of this hit with COVID in a couple, you know, a couple months ago, slash 8 million years ago, whatever time is, uh, you know, suddenly I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is what I've been thinking about all these years. Let's, let's do this. And I've watched groups like Helpful Engineering, Open Source Medical Supplies, Get Us PPE, all these amazing groups come together and instantiate kind of out of, out of thin air a distributed supply chain to meet the gaps left by the, the global supply chain breaking down. Uh, an amazing work has been done. And also the reality that we have to face is that it has barely moved the needle. Uh, you know, the, we like millions of units of PPE have been delivered. 
but also been plagued by you know, kind of gross inefficiencies, uh, lack of coordination, people making things that aren't needed, people designing things that already exist, people delivering things that aren't wanted. Uh, I've seen this time and again. I've worked with people across this entire spectrum and the, the work is being done, but it's not being done with sort of internal awareness. Um, so a lot of what I've been doing is basically coming from looking at, you know, these two realities. The one is, you know, this is the first wave of COVID. There are, there are several more to come before any of us can really go back to anything like normal, if that happens at all. Uh, you know, we've got a, a massive global financial crisis spiraling down at us, you know, food supply chain disruption, uh, not to mention climate change. Like the, the difficulty of this game goes up from here. So what we're doing now is a great start, but it is not nearly enough. Um, you know, and I, I see this as an opportunity for us to, to, to take these things that we're developing in crisis response held together with duct tape and bailing wire and build something durable and flexible that will be ready for the next crisis, not just something that we build in a panic on the fly again from scratch. Most of the conversations that we're having now are the same conversations we had six years ago in the Ebola outbreak and all of those learnings have been lost. Uh, I don't want the things that we've learned this time to be lost for the next one. So given that, Try to rein it in. I know we're kind of mindful of time. Um, a lot of what I've seen basically falls into this framework. We have this we have this supply chain that we're trying to instantiate in a way that is distributed and equitable and organic. Uh, that supply chain needs five main layers. We have design, we have documentation and review, we have demand aggregation, we have distributed manufacturing and delivery logistics. Uh, groups like helpful engineering at the design level are actually just taking you know needs from the community and generating new designs we have groups like open source medical supply that are actually uh, medically vetting those designs and improving the documentation standard to a point where it can be passed off to be fabricated without much back and forth uh, we have groups like um, viral response we have and uh, get us ppe and all of these sort of uh, grassroots community organizations that have sprung up managing their community's needs directly and doing distribution at that endpoint, uh, but aggregating what is needed from hospitals and healthcare workers into these big spread spreadsheets. Uh, groups like Zometry and Zverse that are doing distributed manufacturing really well, uh, and groups like PPE Logistics that are handling the delivery logistics side. However, none of these groups are really talking to each other. They don't have visibility into each other's process. Uh, and in many cases, I've seen people trying to recreate an entire supply chain, starting from the one thing they know how to do well and rapidly ta tapering off into things that they don't do well because they aren't aware of the other folks doing it. What I want to see, what I'm trying to build with Emergency Maker Network is a meta system, something that takes people who are already doing this piece well and that piece well and actually stitching them together in a way that is, you know, meaningfully coordinated and in a way that doesn't require you know, volunteers with spreadsheets to make it happen. So an example of what that would look like. There's, there's one thing right now that every one of these layers touches, and it's something that a lot of all of us here have something to do with, the open source design itself. Uh, you know, that is, so I think it, the, the flow that we're looking at, just to kind of walk you through it and get a little less abstract. So from, you know, imagine if the, all of the designs that we're working with uh, from inception to delivery in the, in the physical world were machine readable and writable, not just a Google Doc or a PDF somewhere, but something machine readable, writable. So the minute that it's, the minute, you know, Helpful Engineering publishes it, it gets, you know, uh, the, the documentation team is like, okay, new, new, dev new design is in, put it through its tests, see if this is rigorous, can this work, is this medically necessary, is this medically safe? Get published into the next repo. Now demand aggregation, all the community organizers know that this is a new design that has been approved. They can start putting it on their systems. The distributed manufacturing systems get updated with this design. They can start, they can feed back and say, okay, this is good, but this doesn't production ready. You know, these feedback loops start to show up. Now that things are being fabricated, the, uh, the people who are like, you know that this specific version of this design was created by this person is being made in these quantities at these places and being delivered to these people who can then 
feedback and say, okay, well, this thing works, but it, you know, it doesn't work here, fix this thing, and that goes back. You can actually close the entire loop. Right now, we don't have this visibility. We have people sort of shouting into the void and talking with you know hundreds or maybe thousands of people in their community on their platform that they have visibility to, but the millions and millions of other people they don't have visibility to, they can't reach. Uh, so what I wanna see is, is honestly built on a lot of the work that you know Tom, you and I did last year in Warsaw, like the, the open know-how standard that we helped develop. This is, this is the use case it was created for. So I've been pushing for an adoption of that um, to try to get everybody to actually start using a machine re machine readable, writable framework for these designs. If we can do that, I think we can actually start moving the needle. We can start stitching these things together because the the scale of this problem is not solvable by any one organization. Uh, we need to work together on this, and we need to be better at it than we are because we're going to need to do it a lot more. Thanks a ton, Nathan. I'm so happy that uh, you plugged in the open know-how and some of the work on the internet of production that connects many of us here even. Yeah, I'm so. It's so pertinent because, you know, it's true that amongst us, we know that well, we've been discussing at length the possibility of, you know, making distributed manufacturing internet enabled you know, that internet of production. And at the dawn of the internet, there were a set of standards that underpinned how we were going to publish to the web and same can be with, with how we design and fabricate products. And now that, you know, the broader mass, you know, a few weeks, months ago, it was amongst us that knew about the potential of distributed manufacturing and distributed design. But now the idea, you know, the work of, all of you here with your shields, with your masks, with your ventilators have hit the mass media. Everyone at large knows about it. And it's true that whilst um, we might be coming back to society briefly, there's this new normal, new reality. And I'm gonna mm -hmm. plug in Oscar Velázquez uh, on that note, um, because Oscar Velázquez is a social, dare I say, serial entrepreneur. He runs an innovation space more than 5K meters squared in Mexico. And he's now preparing an acceleration program um, on this idea of the new reality, how he's been very effective at bringing a community together and thinking up of uh, social uh, impact products. And now he wants to do the same to consider this new reality. N new reality in terms of, yes, healthcare supplies, but also uh, built in built environment solutions through to agri-tech, the climate tech, uh, all of that. So I'm very happy to be plugging you, Oscar, and hearing more about this acceleration program that you've got planned. You oh, can you hear me now? Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to hear you all. It's very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, initiatives. I'm uh, very happy to be, very happy to be uh, among you guys, and uh, very honored. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. One second. Uh, here you go. Uh, okay, where is it? Here you go. Is it sharing already? Okay. Is it? Can you see my computer now? No, right. No, no, no. Okay. Um, there you go. Mm, okay. Can you see it now? That's right. We can. Uh, yep. Okay. So, Oscar Velasquez. Uh, from Mexico City. Uh, I work in an organization. Uh, it's called Impact MX. Uh, we've been working since 2015 uh, here in Mexico, working on something we call democrat democratizing innovation. We believe that um, we want to bring tools, knowledge, uh, frameworks to to normal people. Where we we, we believe that uh, every citizen should be like an, you know, an innovator. Uh, to have a culture of innovation or a, or a, 
or a skill of innovation. Um, so we work with a lot of uh, projects, uh, community projects, uh, trying to teach people how to be innovators, how to solve their problems in their localities. Uh, but also we work with different scales of organizations. We work, we, we work with entrepreneurs, we work with uh, makers, and we work as well with investors. So we go from from uh, like uh, the bottom uh, the bottom uh, of the pyramid uh, people, so working in, in, in communities, doing community work, but also we invest in projects. Um, our, the organization uh, Impact uh, has uh, three branches mainly. One hardware accelerator, uh, a group of in industrial innovation centers uh, uh, that have fab labs. And also we are part of the global network of uh, fab cities that we are trying to design uh, products and services for cities uh, that make the cities resilient and uh, connected. Um, for, we One of the fab labs we have, it's in uh, the Central Library of Mexico, and it's very focused on um, a commu building a community. So, uh, it's a public space, and we have uh, different computers with uh, all the suite from, solid, from the solar systems, like SolidWorks, Catia, different things, so the public can come and use it. And also we have a library of innovation and transition. So we have all kinds of books from business to making technology and uh, design so that people can come and start just thinking how to change their environment. And it's a, it's a public space. So anybody, anybody can come with a project or just uh, come grab a book or use the computers. So it's very public. We, we're trying to just give that in the, in, in the Fabla Bibliothek. Then we also have the Industrial Innovation Center. It's an open, op, uh, open, open innovation industrial center, very focused uh, with uh, circular economy processes and hardware. And it's in the city center of Mexico. We have 3,000 meters there, and uh, it has all facilities from from uh, CAD, uh, hardware, textiles, uh, manufacturing, etc. And then we have a third one, which is, uh, I didn't put this slide here, but uh, it's very industrial, like super, super industrial. We do mass production there. We do um, art. We, we, we built some art, um, some art sculptures that we send to different countries. Uh, my business partner, Eduardo, he's, uh, he's a plastic artist and, and he's an amazing maker. He knows all software and all all machines and all materials and, and he's really amazing when he creates. So there we have uh, different robots and different machines for metal cutting everything. So we have a lot of processes and what we do is we want to, 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 to bring all these uh, uh, processes to people so they can learn and start changing uh, their realities. Um, in a higher level, we have an investment fund and also we have an accelerator. Since 2014, we built uh, around 200 companies uh, in the last two years, two and a half years, we've been very, very focused on, on hardware and also more on circular economy processes. So all the hardware uh, we built are mainly smart hardware. And uh, so for all these five years, we, we, we've been like, building uh, skills for building technology, business uh, and impact and, and also investment. And we use all that uh, to, to, to actually start designing uh, products and services that are needed uh, for uh, uh, significant to create significant change or significant uh, development or sustainable development. Uh, we believe very strongly on creating communities. Uh, we have different groups, uh, large groups in 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 in, uh, in Spanish specifically in Mexico. That one is for you know um, social innovation. We are like around 15 people, very very niche. Another for makers, it's called Makers Mexico. We already built around, it's around 8,000 people. And uh, in that group, uh, a lot of projects have been, have been organized. There's a very large community, they call it Coronavirus Make, uh, Makers Mexico. And they're building uh, with hospitals, uh, different masks and different uh, respirators and different tools that they need for hospitals. Uh, there's another one, another community that started growing there uh, out of the the, the the group on Facebook, uh, it's called Tikum Mola, uh, Tom Tom Makers or something. I think it's an international community that comes. I think it comes from Israel, and these are the numbers. They they create a, a fundraising campaign, 
and they they made splitters, uh, nutrition valve, nutrition valves, the they decathlon mask, and they build the different things, uh, some respirators and different things. And there's a lot of makers that send already uh, there. We we actually use the infrastructure we have, so that people can send us uh, cutting for our lasers from metal to to wood or plastics. Uh, this guy, he's an, uh, an amazing designer in Mexico. He made his own design for a mask and he he was uh, sending it. We also partnered up with some logistics companies uh, for, from uh, bands to to more like uh, FedEx so that we can send different things. Uh, so we kind of were an intermediary uh, trying to put the infrastructure we have and also the, the, the support for makers. Ourselves, we were focused on, on, on creating uh, some projects. Uh, there was some research projects we had, and uh, one of the projects uh, was uh, this consult consultory. It's like a cabin uh, for telemedicine. So we are building it with a partner in China, and basically it's gonna be like it's gonna have like a vending machine and one uh, consultancy with 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 uh, telemedicine. So it's going to have a screen inside. You go in and, and, and we're actually building the, the first prototype. And uh, there's another friend in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in hardware that he also has a company for telemedicine. So we're going to integrate it very easy. And uh, we also, uh, in, in the lab, uh, there was this respirator built. Um, it, it won, it, it's already uh, being, it's, it's, it has been, let me just, I, I, actually, I think I have a, a video here. You're watching my screen, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so there was, so we have uh, metal machines for cutting and there are some electronic components. So this was one of the prototypes. Uh, my, my business part was very focused these days. And uh, then also, a lot of people came. I know actually he made like this. I think we made, he made around, uh, I don't know, 5,000 of these and we just started giving them away, uh, like some uh, masks. And um, also because we were in a way, uh, one organiza intermediate organization that we had some skills. We wanted to focus more on the support and, and, and as well. So we, we were gonna launch uh, a makeathon so with all the all the partnerships we have for materials, for machines, for other labs, or our, our labs ourselves, uh, and also we have ways to get some funding for projects. So we were going to launch a COVID uh, makeathon, but we saw that there was so much already that we decided to focus it on the post-COVID, and we call it new realities. We're going to launch this uh, makeathon uh, at the mid mid June. And it's very focused on pilots. So we partner up with different incubators, fab labs, makerspaces, innovation centers, and some uh, very uh, amazing brands for software, hardware, materials, and some funding, and some banks as well, so that we can uh, uh, support the some some uh, some pilot projects and help them through the accelerator uh, scale, uh, or also to create uh, some uh, structured business. Also, because we want some projects to actually have legs afterwards. We, we, we really want projects to, to, to survive and not just like be uh, just one very quick idea for emergency, but actually to have some um, economy after in the projects. Uh, so we're going to have this, uh, ma this uh, make a ton to, to filter some projects. Then we're going to have an acceleration program for uh, one month. And also there we're going to finance and fund some projects and uh, help them um, connect uh, to hospitals or to different places. We, we don't really know, but we are focused on home, work, city, and in general, uh, planet. So we, we are also thinking how what's gonna be the new reality. So I'm not really sure what kind of projects we're gonna get, but we want to get some scalable projects. And uh, we're gonna do a weekend of fundraising uh, with some, um, we're gonna have some talks and also some kind of TED talks and also some uh, concerts from uh, some artists to do fundraising for this project. So we're gonna get some seed funding as well, doing some fundraising for these projects. And uh, yeah, that's that's our work in, in, uh, in COVID-19. Uh, um, I love building communities. Uh, I love building frameworks and, 
and, and methodologies for, for, for structuring projects uh, to be replicable and scalable. And, and that's my work. Thank you, Oscar. You're welcome. I think it's clear from everyone's presentation here that this phrase that I have to my left is too true, that ingenuity can't be locked down. All of you are just exemplar. And I would like to now uh, bring in our co-founder and CEO, Tom, because beyond having 15 years of experience in developing technological systems for social innovation, he's actually the um, what part of the founding team of the Impact Hub Network. Those of you that know the co-working network in I think over 80 countries, um, way before WeWork was ever anything. And he was very much part of that seed culture, building the community that now is in so many locations. So, Tom. Thanks, Christina. Um, and uh, yeah, wonderful to, uh, to hear from, from everyone um, about different approaches that people are taking to, to building communities to fight COVID-19. It's pretty, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, amazing and humbling to, to hear about all of these, these different projects that, that people are working on. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, we're, we're, we're trying to do, do our bit. Um, uh, in the question of how to build and scale open hardware communities is basically the question that we were trying to answer when we started Wikifactory. Um, since then, we, you know, we've built a social platform for collaborative product development. Um, our aim is to bring down the barriers to developing new products, um, uh, manufacturing them, getting them to market. Um, uh, we've, we've, we've currently got around 20, 28,000 product developers on Wikifactory. It's growing pretty fast. Um, and, and of course, uh, we're, we're facing those the same challenges as everyone in terms of how you, how you scale that, uh, that collaboration, how you try and manage um, that and, and, and make the most of, of all the amazing talent that we have on, on the site um, and, and in the community. And that, that's a huge challenge. Um, so when, when all of this started, this crisis started, um, we, uh, you know, we had a number of spontaneous projects popping up on Wikifactory. Um, and we uh, decided to, to create viral response as a dedicated platform for, for building these, these projects. Um, of course, um, you know, we've had thousands of people join and got, uh, over 50 projects on, on viral response right now. But we're really a small part of, of a much bigger international uh, movement, which we heard about today. And it's like, I mean, it's crazy when you think that probably the communities here have like more than 100,000 people uh, combined who are all trying to put their efforts into um, in, into solving and building products to solve COVID-19. So, so it's, it's truly incredible what, what we should be able to do together. And I guess with that, I'd like to, to to echo many of the points that Nathan was making um, uh, and, and the real problems that we have to solve. And in some ways, maybe this crisis is kind of like the, 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 the catalyst to, to forcing us to solve those problems, but, but, but those problems have, have, have existed for a long time. Um, and that's basically about, you know, how do we scale open source hardware communities and how do we scale collaboration uh, to solve big problems in general? Um, because, you know, as we, we've seen, like, um, you know, it's very easy for noise to become a problem as soon as you've got thousands of people coming into projects. And I've learned so much from watching the way you guys are all managing that problem over the last months um, and, and really kind of like setting up the structure so that it's clear how people can contribute, uh, how they can, um, how they, you know, basically like how they can prepare themselves to be able to contribute and, and all of that. Um, connecting projects with the skills they need, etc., and really this kind of like hosting of communities is is the key aspect from from my perspective. Uh, how do you like connect people with the people that share their interests and probably differ in in backgrounds, um, uh, differ in their skill sets, um, uh, and yeah, the. The, the challenges that we faced, I think, you know, with, with this is that suddenly um, it's become very real that it's not okay to just have a collaboration between product developers. Um, that's, that's fine, but it doesn't really take us to where we need to be. We need to be engaging manufacturers. We need to be engaging 
auditors and accreditors, accreditation bodies. We need to be engaging the end users um, in, in 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 medical field, um, and and very much the development and aid community as well. So there's so much um, that that needs to be done in terms of that coordination, and it really you know does come down to um, how do you know again how do we scale collaboration? And I think the the, the, the difficult question there is what is collaboration? Um, because in the end, it is quite limited the scale at which we can collaborate on a deep way in on a conceptual on a conceptual level and so on. But um, but if we can build the the kind of systems that allow us to coordinate better, and like if you look at the open source software world, that's what collaboration really means. It means you know, more like coordination, more like reuse. Um, of existing designs and learning from existing designs and in this way collaboration is basically an unlimited thing um, and you know, more like uh, yeah I'd like to echo Nathan's points really about um, the, the internet of production as we call it um, and defining the protocols for for working to for being able to produce in a distributed way being able to map manufacturing capacity across the world so that it's actually possible for us to, to produce it in a distributed way. And like what we need right now is open source development um, of, of, of products to, to solve a, a very pressing problem and then and then to be able to, to scale out and produce in local markets. And that's a difficult problem and hopefully you know, this can be the catalyst to, to begin to solve that and to, to kind of give everyone a reason to, to pull together to do that. That's it for me. <laughs> You're here. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Christina, we can't hear you on mute. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. I think that core question actually about bringing together a broader set of stakeholders is exactly the question I wanted to give uh, to the floor because it's exactly right. It's not about just collaborating as designers and engineers, um, but moreover, medical practitioners. Uh, and actually, I would like to open up the floor to Barbara, because I think uh, Caribos have done a great job in developing, say, methodologies and, and some guidelines as to how you uh, bought out new products with with the practitioners, what did you do? Is there an aspect, I remember having sessions with Enrico where uh, just small things like bill of materials doesn't speak to, to the medical professional. Might as well call it shopping list. Um, what do you have to say, Barbara? Okay, yes, as I said, I mean, Enrico has much more experience in this than me personally, or Praline also from VAG and, and lots of people who are working in Carables. Um, but just what I get from them also in our weekly uh, discussions is that um, they have, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still a struggle, I have to say, you know, in Carables, uh, in some countries, we are better than others already getting also healthcare people into all this, but it has changed a bit, you know, so there are already hospitals who already started setting up fab labs, or in Italy, you know, we have one partner who is taking care of kids with very special needs, and they, they once that somebody, one of the donators, they gave them a 3D printer, and they didn't know what to do with it, so they asked the makerspace, how can we use that, you know, and that's how they started and now they're a big fan and they're producing lots of things for kids uh, with very special needs, like a special bicycle for kids who cannot run, run, run a normal bicycle or some writing aid and, and lots of other stuff, but that's how it started for them. So it's always different, but at least with some people I talk already, we have this idea of implementing, for example, little fab labs in hospitals and really showing them, you know, what you can do in a small space with, uh, you know, doing it with, with, with these tools nowadays and not uh, producing for the mass market, but producing really for that very special kid or, you know, that very special patient uh, that you need. But one thing I would also like to point out, I mean, what, what we're still also trying to find out is, for example, um, legal aspects, you know, because as soon as you produce some uh, health uh, related products, um, you get into this area where you don't know, am I allowed to distribute it? 
who can use it and, and under what conditions and things like that. And so we do feel that now also what we saw with the COVID crisis, maybe there is a chance, you know, so maybe there is a chance to, a chance to also change things here a little bit at least, but we, are, we have had this idea of working on a prescribable careable for a while, so that also the costs, for example, would be taken over by social security. And that's something that we still are working on. And if anybody has ideas there, we're happy also to collaborate. But yeah, as I said, it's really still a little <laughs> struggle for us as well. But we, we had been working on that for, for two years now, really focusing on health and care products. I think your point is absolutely bang on. The idea of uh, bringing first an awareness of the, the utility of fabrica digital fabrication tools to medical practitioners through fab labs directly in the in the hospitals is quite right actually last week we had uh, two weeks ago in the first session we had um bitfab that launched a fab lab in gregorio marianion one of the bigger hospitals of madrid uh, that ex shared his experience and i think that's something that you know from a from a funding perspective it would make a ton of sense to to increase access to these machines directly in the hospitals themselves so they can de develop these kind of custom devices on the fly and directly with the patients um barry you i saw from your your presentation that part of the process that you've put in place in managing the swarm to incubate is, is actually this peer review process i'd love to hear how you've been involving uh, medical experts a broader set of stakeholders in into the work of helpful engineering. Um, it's been a, a tricky process, uh, as you know. We are uh, we're trying to take our QA and RA procedures and make them available in a, in a number of different forms. So, from the idea of the swarm, uh, the groups that are just operating and and, and helping with uh, help that we're helping with without formal invitation into the process, uh, we've uh, gathered all the FDA requirements and the NIOSH certification requirements and those types of things for products uh, that can be reviewed by the teams that are using it. Once you come to work with us, uh, then we also provide you with uh, QA leads and uh, a quality management system that you can work within that allows us to, uh, you know, if you fill out the forms, uh, you know, quality management tools allow you to kind of fill out the forms with answer all the proper questions. And then the tool itself will fill out the proper FDA required form for you. And you're able to, to submit those things. Now that's still a lot of, a lot of work and the FDA's rules have been relaxed from what they used to be. But overall, the two things about that are, number one, they're not as relaxed as everybody thinks they are. It's not like a go ahead, build whatever you want. Um, they kind of allowed you to move from a waterfall process of you have to write it first and then approve it and then move on to the next to allowing more of an agile, you can do two things at once uh, kind of process, but you still need the documentation. You still need to abide by the rules and regulations. And so, um, it's become a lot more difficult for us to, uh, once you get into that phase and you're, you know, these are uh, important and uh, life, potentially life saving or life ending products. If you're putting somebody, if you're building a ventilator, you're building respirators, you're building those kinds of things. Uh, these are, these are health products that you want to be sure work. Uh, as I tell people that we work with here, would you put your mother on one? That's the, you know, that's, that's literally the question that I ask as we start to unpack QA and RA, you know, regulatory issues is, would you put your mom on this product? And, and so uh, we're, you know, uh, we're working with, with groups to do this, but to bring up a point that Tom had brought in earlier, I think that um, we're kind of reaching this point amongst the groups that we should be trying to potentially work together as groups to kind of uh, identify our lanes. What are we? What are we really good at as individual groups, and how can we work together to not duplicate a lot of work? You know, we don't need to create a. You know, we we have a team that uh, does logistics for us, so that we can you know that we can start moving masks back and forth. But we also know that other groups uh, on this call and not on this call have built uh, those chains as well. And I think it is uh, very uh, very beneficial for all of us to start talking a little more together and seeing how we can work together as you know as as independent teams and 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 play to all of our strengths i couldn't agree more barry that is absolutely correct especially when you know just to plug in rojan here uh, i really enjoyed how you involved say the biker community for logistics point of view 
also in terms of the protocols and guidelines on you know, how to use masks, how, how to disinfect. It strikes me that you know, uh, a lot of the action, whilst we can share recipes globally, and that makes sense, many of the times when we're involving a broader set of stakeholders, they're tied to local circumstances and local rules and regulations. You mentioned the FDA in the US, but it will be different in every country. How's it been like in terms of sharing those guidelines and, and resources, Rojan, over at Team OS VX? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it has been an interesting journey with all of those stakeholders. And I would say we've probably shied away from calling ourselves open source and open innovation for, for the reason that it's the term scare some of the other groups, you know, open source innovation speaks to engineers and maybe computing groups more so than it does our frontline staff. So in trying to get our designers and our artists and people on board, we've just been talking about volunteering and community. Um, and, you know, when we're sharing our guidelines and our methods, we're not anticipating that they have a background knowledge, you know, of this kind of, of work together, um, you know, even some of our frontline staff may not have worked in teams, let alone collaborative online teams. Um, so, so I think not under, you know, not anticipating uh, those things are is important for our for our groups. And then also, I think, you know, like that was was said just a minute ago, um, we really need to be careful that we're not cannibalizing each other. Uh, and like that, that's why I've tried to. You know, we've shared channels between uh, viral response and between helpful engineering because we don't want people to have to choose between. We want them to be able to, you know, without borders, migrate between the different channels, uh, kind of finding information and, and, and bringing it to the relevant groups if needs be. So I think um, the way that we've been kind of resourcing our group and our members is to be open and collaborative on the channel, but externally too. And, and if someone is interested in what we're doing, we say, oh, you know, join the channel, see what you think. Or if you prefer to chat on the phone, we can do that too. We're trying not to, to create kind of an exclusivity about what we're doing. Fantastic, Rajan. And it really echoes some of the conversations that Nathan, you and I have been having for quite a few weeks now. Because Nathan, at the start of this all, I started helping moderating the open source medical supplies Facebook group, and it mm -hmm. went super international and now is uh, pushing on the emergency maker network. Mm -hmm. And this facilitative role that you're hosting is, is quite right, trying to bring down barriers. How are you doing that? Was that for me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, well, so. A lot of what I've been been looking at as I've just so I've been watching all this unfold for the last couple of months is trying to trying to see ways that you know we can we can optimize what's currently happening. Uh, we have the the very real problem that I see over and over again is that it is it continues to be easier for people to look at a problem and decide to just invent a whole new solution for it from scratch. Than it is to discover the things that already work and duplicate and iterate on them to improve them for the current situation. So people are having hackathons and prototyping new things uh, rather than like because that, that is still easier, painfully, than finding the things from the last hackathon that someone else did, you know, the next date over. Um, and so, you know, it's it has been this arduous process, but it's been. Uh, I found that I found that a lot of what I've said to here today to you guys about you know the nature of the problem and the the scale of what we're doing uh, and the, the mismatch between the scale of our actions and the scale of the problem that seems to bring everyone together. Um, if you start with that, acknowledge that people are doing good work, but that we need to do more and that we need to do it together because the scale the scale of the problem is just too big for any one person to even attempt it, no matter how good your platform is. Uh, that that has really successfully brought people together and gets people talking about okay well how how can I do what I do well and bring it to the table so that we can all do the thing that we do well and that together becomes the thing that actually solves this problem. Uh, you know everyone wants to everyone wants a platform 
Uh, and frankly, I think there's too many. Um, we, we were originally, you know, every platform becomes, every platform is competing with each other for attention. And we, we need to be able to stitch people, stitch the things together so that they're all part of this. So Emergency Maker Network really moved away from building another platform because it seemed obvious that there was more than enough as it is to this sort of middleware, like API architecture uh, and sort of backend container so that you can move seamlessly the things that are important between the existing platforms. You know, if you are a member of the public and you need to, and you want to say, you know, this is speaking for my community in this place at this time, we have this need. Uh, the system, you know, of all the people who are already part of it, we don't need to build a new thing, but the, the pieces that already exist should be able to say, here are open source designs that already meet that. Uh, here are people who can iterate on and add to those ideas. Here are people who can fabricate it. Here are people who can deliver it to you. Here are ways that you can get involved. Here are ways that you can support it. All of these things exist. They just need to be tied together. And we all need to be willing to come to the table and say, okay, here's my platform. Here's my community. Here's me letting go of my ego around owning this and saying, okay, this is what you need to have access to it. Here is the API architecture for our platform. This is all you need to be able to pass in a request and get data out. If we can all come to the table and start doing that. Then we can actually make this as big as it needs to be. I completely agree. I think, uh, Tom, since you've been uh, developing some technical um, concepts and frameworks from an internal production point of view, it's as if, you know, indeed there is maybe a false competition that we're complete, uh, this idea of which Telegram group or which WhatsApp or which Slack group is better or, or better at tackling the solution. But even if you were to take a one step further downstream of which platform is best to host those designs, there still is a whole bunch of technical information in terms of how we uh, fabricate our designs, how we distribute them that who, with learnings that is kind of lost in the desktop. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, design to production steps that happen on your desktop and not shared online. So how we configure our machines for that specific design of a shield or ventilator, this is kind of the elephant in the room. So partly like we need to fund that infrastructure and in internet production where it doesn't really matter where the design is hosted, um, where the communications is happening, but we can actually create an internet enabled design to production flow. I think I, Tom has can better. Uh, I just elaborate on it. Really, you, you said you said most of what I what I would have to say about it, I guess. But um, but yeah, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's also it's also about um, you know, the the manufacturing processes. Um, so um, yeah, like I think I think what's it's very true that a lot of it is a lot of the information is still sitting on the desktop and a lot of information is still sitting on the factory floor inside factories if we're talking about really being able to manufacture manufacture in a distributed way if we're talking about uh, really being able to like share designs in a way that are useful um to be able you know to, and, and actually being able to achieve quality in a distributed way which is really the challenge here which I think it's going to be extremely hard to do anything beyond a national level at this stage. Um, I mean, even that's tricky, but but I think that's possible. Um, yeah. So I mean, I also think it's uh, when it comes to this question about platforms and protocols. Um, yes, we need uh, the protocols to be in place. Uh, yes, we need the API structures to be in place so that it doesn't matter. And uh, you know, what, we're, what we're working on there is a number of things. So, um, you know, as the Internet of Production Alliance, largely, right? So, so it is one one effort that, that Nathan and I are basically talking about. Um, and of course, we encourage others to get involved in in that effort. Um, but, but I think like there's there's a tendency to jump to that before we even have the problem solved. Um, so, yes, we need to share our APIs urgently, but actually have we really solved the underlying problems in a centralized way before we get to the decentralized part um what one of the things that that that's important is yes 
projects are hosted currently in one place or the other. Um, so it's important to have the standards in place so that it's, po you know, it's possible to use those projects wherever they are uh, you know, independently of, of their hosting location. And the Open Know How project has done a significant step in that respect. Um, but I think the next part of that needs to be creating something like a package management system for hardware. And, and that is exactly about you know, being able to you know, use, reuse um, components from one project in another project, being able to produce on a manufacturing platform the same design wherever it's hosted, um, be, basically having, having a universal way of describing hardware projects in the same way that you do in most programming languages. Um, for, for finding those packages. And then there's the part about defining the, the protocols by which we map manufacturing. And again, there's this open nowhere project, which is in very early stages um, uh, to, to begin to solve that. I think it's great that, that those processes are in place, but I mean, we shouldn't forget that while the open know-how specification exists, there isn't a single implementation of it. Um, so, in some ways, it makes more sense to develop a first implementation first before you standardize. Um, of, of course, we need some level of agreement on that, but there, there isn't even you know, a single site that publishes a metadata format about their projects properly yet. I think there's Apropedia just began uh, doing that with a few projects, which is really nice, but, but otherwise, as far as I'm aware, no one has. We actually have Emilio here as participant. He joined oh. in the first session. Nice. Uh, Emilio. <laughs> Of Wikipedia, which is super great. Um, and thanks, Tom. I just want to also mention that it's not just about these technical advances. There's something that um, a few of you mentioned today about bringing together also the arts and, and the cultural industries. And it reminds me of this quote that I shared with Oscar, and I would like you to mention about your accelerator what your plans are specifically on involving the arts and the culture. But in the talk in preparation to this debate, uh, a quote came to my mind that has rung truth for many years now. And it's this idea of, if you wanna change the dominant paradigm, you have to have more fun than they are and let them know whilst you're doing it. There's an aspect of really empowering and inspiring a change rather than making people feel guilty or having a uh, force to, to do something um, to change their ways. I think there is a way of, of, of inspiring, you know, this change towards distributed design, distributed manufacturing that feels like it's, it's, it's aspirational, desirable. Also, of course, it should be sustained, uh, accessible and affordable. Um, what are your plans, uh, Oscar, in terms of this accelerator to really give that desirability bang so that, you know, it can appeal to to a broader, broader community of designers and engineer, uh, and innovators at large. Yes. Okay, so um, from our perspective, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something about design. So what we do is uh, we do uh, impact by design. We don't really talk about it or try to convince people or, or, or spam people with like uh, imposing messages of sustainability. You have to be this way or have to be that way. So what we do is we make products fun and we make products uh, desirable uh, by actually making very, very good products that people love and enjoy. So we very focus mo much on the usability part, on the design part and, and the experience of the products that we build. Uh, for instance, we have one project, it's called, uh, I actually have, have it here. Uh, I'll just show it to you. Uh, here. And let me start. <laughs> here you go. Well, I'll just talk about it. Um, if I find it, I find it. So this project, it's a, it's a hardware for, um, I just got it. Here you go. I start. So this product, it's a hardware for uh, uh, for planting uh, stuff in your house and also in restaurants and retails. So we started uh, thinking that we wanted to reduce the footprint of vegetables that, you know, you bring something from really far, far away and it has a high, very, very high impact uh, footprint. 
and uh, well, we wanted to reorganize, but we just wanted to make it easy for people to order their food at uh, 50 kilometers radius uh, with some local producers and that they can stack up uh, and, and grow them. We, we don't really want them to grow. We actually, it's just a place for you to stack your products so that they go, don't go bad in the, in the, in the fridge. So we just solve uh, you, like some problems that uh, really have uh, uh, some pain in people. Like, you know, when you buy some vegetables, 30% goes to waste. Uh, and that's actually the real problem to users. Not real. I mean, they care for, you know, like all the water that is spent uh, in agriculture, but the, the, the factor is actually to make it easy for them so that they don't feel bad because their vegetables, 30% of their vegetables are getting rotten. But the product in the impact that we do is uh, we save 99% of water in one meter square. We can plant up to 200 plants and it has a lot of really cool features, but we just make it like really nice product, really easy to use and solve meaning, meaningful problems to users. And I think that's impact by design that actually us being very responsible on designing the highest uh, level of uh, impact within your products and not really uh, actually focusing on imposing it to, pro to, to, to the users. So that's what we do. We, we do that. And uh, we're trying to get more uh, designers and engineers into the product dev because before you, we, we wanted to do sustainable products and, and services, but uh, we lack the technical part. Now we actually are working with super technical people and designers to with the products and then we help them we brought them into the impact by design processes i'm not sure if that's something that answers what you asked me wait gracias oscar yes Thank you. i have See? been told i have one question you know it's already going to be an hour and a half that we started i just have a question to all of you it's a very quick one I would love for you all to answer in a sentence, in your perspective, what is the most important factor in building a community that can make a real difference? Nathan, you first. I saw you <laughs> unmute. <sighs> the most important factor in building a community that can make a real difference. Exactly. <sighs> The thing, so again, just speaking from what I've observed in a lot of the communities that have spun up to respond to this recently, um, I have seen, as, as I mentioned, we all have uh, a lot of really good work and good people go to waste because people come in and bring their ego to the table and say, this is, this is my project now, this is the thing I'm doing, this is the story I'm telling. And I've seen a lot of things fall apart because of that. Um, you have you have to be there for the results. You have to be. You, you need a scientific mindset. You need to say, what it, what is our theory about how we're doing this, and how do we measure that? How do we know if we're succeeding or failing? And base and like get everyone in the community to buy in that that is how you measure things. Someone can have very strong opinions, and that's fine. You can talk about it, but if the results show that what you're doing isn't having the impact you want, you change what you're doing, uh, and it doesn't matter how anyone feels about it. Uh, you have to reference reality. And, and the more you get involved in people's egos and feelings about it, the further away from reality you get and you're not gonna have an impact. Thanks. I could ramble on that for a while, but I feel like we all know <laughs> how that story goes. Um, hey. to, to add to that, um, I think that, uh, you know, number one, uh, Nathan's right. Uh, people need to check their egos at the door and realize that it's about the product or the project that they're working on and the greater good. Uh, number two for us is trying to set up uh, the actual community itself. Um, people caring about the people that are uh, involved. Uh, you know, we're doing things like we're hosting art projects on the side. We're doing, uh, you know, uh, biweekly happy hours. We're doing a lot of things that get people together and really give, you know, this is a, a lot of people don't realize how unique a moment in history this is. I mean, just for, you know, for what is going on here from this pandemic to how we're responding to it and how this, the, 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 all of these communities are able to form. 
And so for us, it's been a matter of, okay, how do we take this and make this a long-term true community that cares a little bit more and is looking at the longer term, the bigger picture, as opposed to, well, we're going to spin up, we're going to do a ventilator and everybody goes goodbye after that. And so that's been our challenge and, and, and what we're kind of working on in, in, in the big picture right now. So. Thanks. I think, I, I, yeah, I'd just like to, to come back to what I already stressed before, at least this is what I get from, from the people I work with really from the field. It's the, also the trusted relationships, have working with trusted peers and working on, on a shared goal. So just to summarize it very shortly, that was the experience for us in terms of the community building and collaboration. Hey, yeah, um, so for me, I suppose like the definition of innovation is that it's novel and it creates value. And I think that's why people join these communities. They want to do something that feels new and novel and interesting and engaging. And they want to feel like they're creating some value and they're connecting with something that's moving, moving the, the dial. Um, so you, if you can catch them on those regards, you'll keep them forever. Uh, okay, so also adding to that, uh, for me, building a community is very important to have uh, different disciplines, like to be a transdisciplinary uh, thing, uh, to combine it, to have purpose, to actually have a meaningful impact in what they're doing, and also uh, uh, test and validate whatever you're doing, actually bring it to reality, because a, a lot of the communities uh, go around in talking and talking and not really doing, and I believe that uh, communities that do test and have purpose uh, are the ones that are needed and actually having real, real projects to actually do testing. And it doesn't matter if it's, if it's wrong, uh, but actually that's, that's a, good, a good thing actually to start uh, uh, making early mistakes, early cheap uh, mistakes so that you can learn fast. I think that the main thing is actually to start learning fast from real projects in the real in, in the real world, uh, and if you combine different disciplines, uh, they're all going to have uh, different uh, perspectives, and you're going to accelerate learning curves uh, in uh, in processes of application. For me, application is super important. Oh, actually, that's the end goal of everything that we're doing, right? So that's my perspective. Thank you, Oscar, and thank you to everyone. I actually have just one question that. You know, it's already past an hour and a half. But it, I think it's such a valuable question here in the Q&A that it would be a shame not to, to bring it to the table as a parting thought. The question is, what are the next steps to keep this movement going? Because Nathan is quite rightly as mentioned, it's about long-term resilience so that what happened after Ebola doesn't happen this time. What can we do? to keep this movement going. Nathan. Uh, hi, oh, you're gonna go, Nate? Oh, go ahead. No, no, go, go. you sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, uh, to keep it going, you always need to have a business model. Like always, you know, like if you believe in your dreams, uh, eat, I, I, I say in Spanish, like you have to, to be able to eat, you know, from that, or like, you know, mm -hmm. how you have, a, you have to have an income from it, because otherwise you're just like uh, uh, just having it a hobby, and, and we need change, and change is, mm -hmm. uh, should be your, you should be very congruent and actually create the innovation is as well on creating business models and ways of, of uh, self-funding these kind of projects, and uh, never waiting for government or for philanthropy uh, to actually help these kind of movement, movements. I think these movements should create economy, should create new business models and innovate in that part. And that's gonna help uh, make them run and make them last and, 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 and just uh, scale. That's my perspective. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I would uh, amplify that or I would dovetail on that and say that, you know, again, for this to work, we have to be not just self-sustaining, but, but collectively self-sustaining. Um, a big part of what I'm trying to work on, what I would love, you know, anyone, anyone who saw this, who was interested, I would love to talk to you more about is doing this as a systems design exercise, uh, not just as a business design exercise. 
you know, every one of our projects has inputs and outputs. And some of those inputs need to be resources and material and money so that we can all do this and not as beyond just a hobby. Uh, but figuring out what, you know, we all have outputs as well that can be inputs to the other groups. We can find ways that we can, uh, and models that are not just, you know, well, I got mine, keep up and we can do this later, but here's how I get mine, how you get yours and how we all build this together in a way that keeps, our, keeps us all going. Uh, and I think if we're gonna make something that's actually ready for the next crisis, we need to approach it that way. Thanks. I think um, agreeing with uh, what both Nathan and Oscar have said, I think if from an internal perspective, it is working on creating your community so that it is a community and that the people have a reason to be together than just the one thing that they're, that they're working on. I think from an external perspective, uh, as a group or as our groups, uh, you know, move forward to try to, you know, figure out what our strengths are and work together uh, to amplify uh, all of our individual strengths into something that's uh, much more powerful. Uh, I also believe that uh, there is, I think, a, a need for a central repository of what all of the lessons learned are um, so that, uh, you know, as, as we put a bunch of ventilator projects out there, hey, guess what? The new protocols say that ventilators may not be the, the, the proper response for what we're doing here. That does not mean that ventilators suddenly go away and aren't, aren't needed again ever. Uh, mm -hmm. Two years from now, three years ago, we could be facing something different where, great, we just pull these off the shelf, look at all the work that everybody's done, and we work, we begin to work off that. Mm -hmm. And you apply that to all of the different PPE and, and, and food resources and management and those kinds of things. Uh, I think that uh, making sure that all this information does not die um, and does not get lost is uh, something that's extremely important. Yeah, I agree. I think this has been a real test case and we need to learn from all of the communities and what we've done so that we're ready to, to, to engage again when we, we need to. I think the communities do need to converge um, and I think we do need to, to start working with each other. And I also, coming from a university background, I think we need to start thinking about our students in a real way. Um, because of what's going on, thousands of them do not have access to work placements, internships. You know, we, we have a real opportunity to engage um, a whole new generation in the open source community. And I think we should uh, be working towards that somehow too. Agreed. Yeah, yeah uh, I would uh, agree with what everyone's saying really. I mean, we need um, success stories. Right. We need we need stories of, of success, and when I say success, I mean impact at scale. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, you know it's amazing the amount of impact there has been from the maker community already. But when when we look at the scale of the problem, um, the it, it's a tiny it's a tiny impact um, in in proportion, um, and and you know, people need to do that at scale. We're going to need business models that work. Uh, because it's, it's simply not possible uh, for, for everything to happen on a on a volunteer and for free basis to do that. So so basically agree with what everyone's saying, um, uh, and and that's that's our challenge right now. How are we going to arrange that and make that make those success stories happen? Because if we see if we have a few success stories where they really work, then then of course this thing is going to become a mainstream approach to solving problems. Mm -hmm. uh, can I add one th one thing? I don't want to. Push it uh, last thing I would add is is that you know again it's important to to think about this for ourselves and to really keep our communities that we're all trying to manage uh, sort of aware of this fact that you know the the supply chain that's broken down that's that's causing so much uh, death and disarray it's going to be disrupted again. It's the things that will just cause those disruptions are coming faster. Like these, these are the good old days right now. And uh, if we are successful in creating the kind of system that we're all talking about, uh, it will be just as effective at uh, you know, designing and producing and distributing open source humanitarian supplies that have nothing to do with the pandemic. Because uh, the machinery is the same. If we're you know, whether we're talking about flat pack CNC emergency shelter or water purification technology or anything else that you need in a refugee camp, which, you know, the UN expects over a billion climate refugees as all the coastal cities flood in the next 40 years. Like this is, this is a thing that will have real impact on 
the future of our species and its odds of survival, frankly. Uh, you know, keeping that in mind is uh, remarkably focusing. You know, if everyone is thinking about this as, oh, well, when we get back to normal, this might be a thing I do later. That's not the conversation anyone's having, or at least not the one we should be having. To, to Nathan's point, and mm -hmm. this is going to sound odd, uh, we got lucky. This mm -hmm. pandemic did, oh, yeah. was, did not play out to be as bad as, as was originally thought or hoped. And mm -hmm. granted, it's not over to, to this point, and we're looking at other, other but we were, we ranked, we, we, <laughs> we expanded and grew very quickly for mm -hmm. a, a dead start, right? For mm -hmm. just this hadn't happened before and everybody got together, et cetera. But if something like this happens again, we may be called upon to react much more quickly than we did this time. And mm -hmm. so having those teams and having your groups and having those people prepared to, you know, answer the bat signal, um, mm -hmm. you know, hey, it's time to put all our resources together and then solve this immediate problem is something that I think we need to be ready to do as, a, you know, as, a, as all, uh, you know, all of our groups need to be ready to hopefully ready to go do working well together. So here, here. Absolutely, here, here. Thank you, all of you, for your contributions. I feel so refreshed by the perspectives of each and one of you. I hope that we can capture it in the in some of the insights that we'll share back. There was a poll here about um, what some of our next sessions. This is a weekly uh, roundtable that we gather. I have a feeling, I smell that the next one is going to be about uh, accreditation and peer review, It'll be right on topic. Mm -hmm. But we hope to also have a session around manufacturing, also a session around humanitarian relief. I'm really happy to be having uh, these discussions, not least today with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I wish you all safety and health moving forward and a happy return. Thank you so much for putting this together, Christina. Thanks, everyone. Great, Great to, to see you, everyone. everybody. To see Thanks you. to everyone. That's yeah. great. great panel, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Great to meet you. And let's be in contact. Yeah, well, let's keep in touch. Let's keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely. I just I put my uh, email in the, the chat. Uh, anyone can get a hold of me if you want to talk. Yeah.